Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to continue to work on this mic, so it sounds better. Um, but I wanted to welcome everybody. My name is Michonne Martin, and I work at the Attorney General's Office. Again, Michonne Martin from the Attorney General's Office. Thank you all for coming. And to begin, I want to ask everyone to join us in the conversation online. Follow at Nevada AG. So the reason that we are all here is because of the person that I'm going to welcome. And I think she is one of the most fearless people I have known. She has been committed to fighting for Nevadans for her entire career. She takes on big banks and wins to protect Nevadans. Consumer protection, elder abuse, all sorts of different pieces, domestic violence, and now she's taking on sex trafficking. She's joining in this fight so that we are all in this fight together. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my Attorney General, Catherine Cortez Masto. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, let, let me just say, uh, first of all, this fight in sex trafficking is all of ours. It's all of ours. Um, that's why we're here today. Um, I, uh, as your Attorney General, was born and raised here in this community in Las Vegas. And for me, this is personal. Um, I have been uh, hearing about, seeing, and learning how particularly not only our kids, but our young adults are being victimized in this sex trafficking trade. Uh, and it's now time for us here in the state of Nevada to take action. And so this is the first step in that prevention. To me, and this is why we put this together, this today is our dialogue. You're gonna hear from some fantastic folks today from the law enforcement side, um, treatment and services out there. You're gonna hear from some of our legislators. You're gonna hear from victims. Um, the intent here today is to really focus the attention here in our community on what's happening with our kids, what's happening with the young adults on the sex trafficking trade that is impacting us. And I actually implore you, I actually want you to network with one another because it's not all about us just standing here talking to all of you, explaining what we are doing and what we are seeing. It's for all of you that are sitting in the audience to participate. Pick your area. Figure out what it is you want to do to help us address this issue in our state, in our communities, and then take action. This is the first time we have done something like this in the Attorney General's office, particularly on the sex trafficking trade. And we have some fantastic folks, both local and nationally, who are going to be here to talk to you. Uh, and there's some, I'm telling you, tear-jerking stories you're going to hear today. And it's going to tug on your emotional um, purse strings or your ties. Uh, it, it is uh, an issue that you cannot walk away from once you hear what is happening and how our kids and how our children and, and young adults are being impacted. Because quite frankly, they're not just the most vulnerable, they are the vulnerable. And we need to help them. We need to be there to protect them. And that's what this is about today. But the first step in that prevention and finding the solution is the awareness. Without awareness, we are not going to get anywhere. And that requires not only all of us talking about it, being aware of what's happening, understanding it, but all of you getting out there and talking about it. Making sure that your family, your friends, your neighbors are aware of what's happening in their communities. I will tell you, everywhere I go, I talk about this issue. Last night, I was speaking to a young group of girls who do charity work in our community, and I talked about this issue. It was the first time they were hearing about it, but they had questions, and they had concerns, and they won't forget it now. And they're gonna be following what we do here in the state of Nevada to help protect them and their peers. We had over 200 people RSVP to be here today, and it looks like uh, we have just about that many people. So it's an exciting day. Thank you all for being here. You're gonna hear from me throughout the course of the day. At the end of the day, we're gonna close it up and talk about next steps. So thank you again, and let's get started. Uh, thank you so much to the Attorney General for hosting this event and for pulling this together for your leadership on this issue. Thank you all for being here and for taking your day with us. Uh, I looked over the agenda and it's a jam-packed, power-packed day. I think you're going to have a really exciting 
a uh, number of different panels, lots of different experts, and uh, you're in for a really kind of substantive day to really explore this issue and learn much more about it. And thank you for having me here. I'm here with my colleague James Dold here. He's from Nevada, he's from Las Vegas, and he's one of our policy experts who's worked on human trafficking policy all around the country. And so I'm really excited to be here with James as well. Uh, I'm really glad that you got to see a bit of this movie, Not My Life. And we worked with the filmmaker, Bob Bilheimer, for about five years as he was filming that movie all around the world. He filmed slavery on five or six different continents. And he wanted to make sure to include the United States as well, because a lot of people don't include the United States in that discussion. They think, well, let's go film Cambodia, and let's go film the Ukraine, or whatever else. But they don't think to film a case like Angie's. They don't think to look at the streets of Washington, D.C. They don't think to include folks like Rachel Lloyd, who's an amazing expert on this issue. And so the movie does a great job of seamlessly showing that this issue is global as well as here in the United States. And, and Not My Life, it began to come out a bit last year, but I think that next year is gonna be the year that it really starts coming out around the country, and you're gonna see the film being distributed, so I'm glad you got to see a, a brief clip of it. And I think you'll enjoy seeing the whole thing. It's about a little bit more than an hour if you have some time to see it. But my background a bit is I, I, uh, I have been working on this issue for 10 years, and I've been going all around the country and seeing what different communities are doing, looking at different states' laws, working with survivors in different places, and had the opportunity of working on building that national hotline for the country, which came online in 2007. And Polaris was given the very interesting task of call every community in the country and ask who's working on trafficking in that community. Get in touch with law enforcement all across the country so that if you get calls, you can refer those calls to law enforcement. Make sure you have 24-hour staffing and be ready to handle any type of call from any type of person at any moment in the day in any language. And so we had this interesting task of building this national hotline and it's been an incredible, incredible learning curve for us. Not because we're special in any way, but because we got to absorb the information from law enforcement and from service providers all across the country of what they were seeing. And we got to have that national bird's eye view. And with that national bird's eye view, we began to see patterns emerging in the calls we began to see consistency across certain parts of the country. We began to see regional trends. And so we've had this really unique bird's eye perch for the past five years of just sponging and absorbing what this issue looks like and getting a really good sense of how the issue is morphing and changing. So what I've been asked to, to talk to you all a bit about is what does that bird's eye national view look like? And what are some of the major types of sex trafficking not as much focused on the types of labor trafficking, which also exists in the United States, but today we're focusing in on sex trafficking. What do those different types look like? And what are some of the major types that, that exist across the country? What are the major patterns that exist across the country? And then you'll hear from folks later on today of how that specifically applies here in Nevada and in Las Vegas. So I'm gonna be talking about defining it, what is the issue, looking at some types and spotlighting different types. You saw one type there on the issue of sex trafficking happening at truck stops. And we get calls from truckers all the time into the national hotline reporting pimps trying to sell women and girls at different truck stops. We've almost gotten 300 calls from truckers reporting child sex trafficking at different truck stops. So that's one type. But I want to feature a few different types as well. And then move on to the response. So if that's what it is, how do we respond? What's this 3P paradigm of protection, prevention, and prosecution? And what's the framework that the country is using to begin to respond to the issue? And how does that framework apply here? So that's kind of what I'm gonna to try to do in the next 30 minutes or so. I wanna be mindful of time, so there's a clock there, which is great. Strategic positioning of the clock for the speaker. Um, but then, I guess one thing that I wanted to just, to, to just say from the outset is there's a wide spectrum of people here in the room today. There's folks who've been working on the issue for decades. There are folks who are working and investigating these cases. There are people who've studied the issue. Um, and there are also people who are learning about this issue for the first time. So it's a bit of a challenge to address that wide of a spectrum in the room. And so I'm gonna to try to cover some of the basics. For some of you, that might be a, a repeat, but for some of you, that might be new. And so I'll try to create that kind of common denominator for all of us to start with for the rest of the day. But the other issue that I want to throw out there is just to be mindful that this issue is a very difficult subject. It's a tough issue, it's a dark issue, it's a tearjerker, 
and it affects us all in different ways as we start to hear about cases like Angie's, as we start to hear about this level of human suffering that's happening around the country. And for all of Polaris' staff and all of the presentations that, that I've done, last week I had a chance to speak to 60,000 college kids in the Georgia Dome down in Atlanta. So speaking as an audience of 60,000 people, but you talk to a lot of different people and people come up to you and sometimes people are, are very powerfully affected by the issue. Sometimes they get angry, sometimes they feel themselves getting depressed, sometimes they go home after a conference and they feel themselves kind of feeling all out of whack. And, and I wanna just kind of put that out there to say that we're gonna be talking about some difficult subjects today. And even seeing Angie's case of being forced to have sex with all these truckers, those are really difficult things to hear about. And so to be mindful of your own self-care as you're hearing about this different type of human suffering. Maybe you want to go out and go for a jog later tonight and just blow off some steam and get some exercise. Maybe you want to totally decompress and just flip the switch off and say, that was an intense day talking about sex trafficking, but now I'm going to switch gears and go watch Family Guy tonight. Or you know, you're going to figure out whatever you want to do. But the, the, the importance is just to recognize that what we're about to delve into in the next six hours is some difficult stuff. And it's almost like we know that there's gonna be some secondary trauma in the room. We know that folks are gonna hear this. We know that folks might have their own journeys with this issue and their own experiences with this issue. So I wanna be mindful of that. And I want all of you to be mindful of that as well because there's gonna be this kind of pall over this room where we're talking about some really ugly things. People pimping out their own kids. People being forced into the sex trade and having sex with 30 men a day things that we don't want to talk about. But the interesting, and, and I think the hopeful thing is, we're reminded time and time again that when human beings learn about the suffering of other fellow human beings, we're all motivated for action. We all have that kind of empathy bone that, that triggers, and we all say, if that's happening, not on my watch. We want to do something against that. We're, we're a country that doesn't stand for these forms of modern day suffering and modern day slavery, and we want to do something against it. So. Just wanted to say that at the outset. So to, to, to dive into to some of what we wanted to talk about, about defining sex trafficking. So there's this federal law that passed, this law called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. It passed in the year 2000. And what it did is it set out a federal framework for how this country is gonna define the issue of trafficking. And the federal bill actually just came after this big global meeting that everyone met, all these you know, hundreds of countries met in Palermo, Italy, and they all agreed on this international definition of the crime. And then each country took that international definition and passed it into its own federal laws. And so there's this international uniformity and then this federal uniformity that started to happen. And so you have this international conference that happens and then this federal crime that gets passed in the year 2000 and this comprehensive framework for the country starting to respond to the issue of modern day slavery and human trafficking really began to take shape in the year 2000. So how did they define the issue? They defined the issue in these three buckets. The first two buckets dealt with sex trafficking and the third bucket dealt with labor trafficking. So the first bucket that they defined is kids who are being pimped out in the commercial sex trade. So when you have children under the age of 18 who are being induced into commercial sex acts, and they're being, sometimes you say they're being turned out, sometimes you have someone sexually exploiting them. They're saying that is a form of child sex trafficking. That's the first bucket. Where is it happening? Who is it happening to? How big is it? You heard the estimate on the, the movie there. Some people estimate about 100,000 kids in the United States are experiencing that. So that's that first bucket. Sometimes it's immigrant children, sometimes it's US citizen children. Sometimes it's people in the foster care system, in the child welfare system. Sometimes it's people who have that level of vulnerability. But what is that first bucket of kids who are being sexually exploited and who have pimps who are in the commercial sex trade? Second bucket, also talking about sex trafficking, but now looking at adults, people age 18 or over. This is talking about adults who are in the sex trade, who are being pimped in the commercial sex trade, but there's some element of force, fraud, or coercion that's keeping them there. So there's violence, there's threats, there's deception, there's manipulation, there's different types of coercion. 
there's something keeping the person in the sex trade and beginning to engage in those commercial sex acts. So you have this form of child sex trafficking which doesn't require the force fraud or coercion, but it does require them to be a child. And you have this type of adult sex trafficking which does require the force fraud or coercion and those types of violence and threats and deception. So that's really what we're gonna be talking about today are those two main buckets. And what we can be asking as a community and what you're gonna hear from different panels talking about is where is that happening? Where's that first bucket happening? Where are the kids in the sex trade? Is it truck stops? Is it online? Is it on the streets? Where are kids in the sex trade? And then the second bucket we'll be talking about are where are there adults in the sex trade who are experiencing that level of violence and force and coercion? And oftentimes when you have pimps, how many pimps do you know that don't engage in every, any level of violence or coercion and they're just kind of these benevolent pimps that say, oh, stop whenever you want. I've got no vested interest in you. Go ahead, take the day off or whatever else. Most pimps are starting to engage in some form of manipulation, some form of exploitation, some form of uh, kind of shoving that person in a certain direction. And so when you begin to say, is there any difference between pimping and sex trafficking, Maybe there kind of is, conceptually, but when you begin, begin breaking it down of how pimps really do behave on the day-to-day, -day, you begin to see a lot of similarities. So we're gonna be talking about violent and coercive pimping. And then you have this whole third bucket of labor trafficking, which we're not focusing as much on today, but I encourage you all to learn about because there are all these forms of labor trafficking around the world. People held in domestic servitude in homes, people held on farms, people held in small restaurants, people held in different sweatshops and factories, people held in nail salons and, and all these different, you know, selling magazines door to door. The types of calls that we get into the National Hotline about all these different types of trafficking is, is, is just mind boggling, actually. So looking at those first two buckets, who is this happening to? It can happen to men and women, it can happen to boys and girls, it could happen to US citizens as well as immigrants who are brought into this country, it could happen to adults and children. So we're looking at a pretty broad spectrum there. And who's doing the trafficking? Is this all kind of the Russian mob and the international organized crime? And what you actually realize is that there's a wide spectrum of different traffickers. You have folks that are kind of engaging, we see cases on the national hotline of interfamilial trafficking or intimate partner trafficking, where someone is actually trying to pimp out their own girlfriend or their own wife. You see parents pimping out their children. And so those aren't international organized crime syndicates, those are just kind of a very small, uh, singular individual beginning to engage in this type of crime. And then you begin to go along the spectrum where you do see increasing levels of organization. You see people working together. You see multiple brothels being organized. And then you see further increasing levels of organization where you do see sometimes transnational organized crime. And I know the Attorney General is gonna be looking at this issue from that angle of transnational organized crime. So one of the challenges of talking about the issue of sex trafficking is we're talking about sometimes very local crime happening with parents and with individual pimps and individual brothels spanning to very much transnational organized crime involving transnational organized crime groups and all of it can still occur in those two buckets of trafficking because the spectrum of traffickers is actually quite broad. So that's one challenge for us as a field and for law enforcement and for service providers is you're dealing with a very broad tent of how the issue's been defined that spans those different, those different levels of organization and different levels of crime. So I wanted to spotlight a couple of different types of trafficking. So one, you've heard me talk a little bit about this. Um, we've actually received over 400 calls on the national hotline with people reporting cases of this type of trafficking, which is familial trafficking or intimate partner trafficking where someone is actually trafficking their own child. They may have a, a drug addiction, and they begin selling their child around the neighborhood so that they can make money to feed their own drug addiction. They may be uh, in an intimate, romantic relationship and begin trying to pimp out their girlfriend or pimp out their wife. And so it's actually very similar to the issue of domestic violence. And you see some of these, in, these, these overlaps between trafficking and the issue of domestic violence where it's a domestic violence situation that begins to evolve into a pimping situation as well as a domestic violence situation. Where that person in that situation might not identify themselves as a pimp or proudly declare, I am a pimp, but they're actually engaging in, in what would be defined as human trafficking. 
So that's one type that we could explore today is this intimate, intimate partner familial trafficking. The major type of trafficking that we hear on the national hotline is domestic pimp control. U.S. citizen pimps, people who identify themselves as pimps, people whose main profit incentive is to try to turn people out of the sex trade and make money off others in the sex trade, and then begin using force and fraud and coercion to do that, or begin exploiting children. So when we hear about sex trafficking on the national hotline, over 50% of the time it's someone reporting a domestic pimp beginning to engage in violent sex trafficking or pimping out a child. And so where are pimps doing that? Maybe it's in street prostitution, maybe it's in strip clubs, maybe it's in some sort of hotel, maybe it's in some sort of escort service, maybe they're using an online website like Backpage.com and they're putting women and girls up for sale on Backpage, maybe they're going to truck stops. Pimps are pretty adaptable guys and they're going to wherever there are people buying sex, they're going to try to go there and try to get in on some of those profits. So you have this kind of very diverse, very morphing, adaptable, shape-shifting, constantly changing forms of pimping that are responding to different market dynamics and trying to respond to wherever there's that demand for commercial sex and then try to pimp out adult women or children in the commercial sex trade. A lot of these are U.S. citizen pimps. Sometimes they have only one or two women or girls under their control. Sometimes they have dozens. And so you have this spectrum of different pimps, of, of who's a tennis shoe pimp, who's a Mac daddy pimp, all these different, this hierarchy of pimps that you actually see. And so a lot of what we're talking about is very violent pimping. And that's actually the majority of what we hear about on the national hotline. Another thing that, we, that you could talk about, another type of sex trafficking in the spotlight is actually the entire very insular sex trade that exists within the Latino community. And you have an entire sex trade that exists that caters specific to Latin American men. And it's not actually open to any other ethnicity, any other ethnicity or race of men. You have to prove you are a Latino male to even access some of these brothels, even access some of these places. And by me saying this, I'm not trying to spotlight any particular ethnicity, I'm not trying to spotlight any particular race, I'm not trying to say this is only happening in this one community, I'm just trying to show this mosaic of all the different types that, of places that exist. But you see this whole network across the country of residential brothels that victimize women from different Latin American countries, from Mexico, from Honduras, from different parts of Central America, and they then advertise through business cards and through word of mouth to different Latin American men. And it's a very high volume business where uh, the sex acts usually cost about $30 for 15 minutes of commercial sex. And so the women in one of these residential brothels might be sitting there having sex with a different guy every 15 minutes for 12 hours. And so they'll have sex with 30 or 40 men a day. And so you've seen a whole spectrum of major state prosecutions and major federal prosecutions cracking down on this particular sex trafficking network that is targeting Latin American women as, as women and children as victims and targeting Latin American men as the buyers. And so a lot of people don't know about this network because it's so word of mouth and it's so insular, but it actually exists in lots of places around the country and it's very prevalent in, in the DC area where I'm from where there was times when there was dozens of these brothels in downtown DC, and dozens of these brothels in the whole DC metropolitan region, where it was either a residential brothel, or it was an escort, quote unquote, delivery service, where they're driving the women around to where the, where the, where the guys are, or it's a cantina bar, where they're selling the girls in some sort of bar or restaurant environment that has a brothel attached to it. And then the distinguishing feature is, are there children involved, and is there some sort of force, fraud, or coercion involved? And that's a pretty prevalent commercial sex network that exists nationwide. Sometimes they're driving the women out to places where there are Latino farm workers. And there's actually a mobile brothel that goes out to different farm, farm situations in Florida, or in South Jersey, or in North Carolina, or in LA, or in San Diego, and the brothel actually tries to drive the women out in a delivery service and deliver the women to the different farm workers that are there who might purchase commercial sex. So you have that network that exists. You have a whole other network that exists, which is the whole Asian sex trafficking network that exists in the United States. Over 5,000 fake massage businesses that are claiming to be this kind of legitimate massage, but actually it's a front for a brothel. And the women inside are Korean, Chinese, Thai, from different parts of Southeast Asia. You have residential brothels that are part of that Asian network. 
you have escort services that are part of that Asian network, and then you have these fake massage businesses that are part of that Asian network, which primarily targets and victimizes Asian women, and sometimes targets Asian men who are buying commercial sex, and sometimes opens it up to all men who are buying commercial sex, whether or not it's an open or a closed network. You have gang-controlled sex trafficking. We've had a whole slew of cases in Northern Virginia where we saw the Crips, MS-13, doing what they do as a gang. They're trying to make money from stealing and extortion and drug trafficking and firearm sales, but they've actually begun to engage in sex trafficking as part of their diverse money-making activities. So they're trying to est establish territorial dominance as a gang, but on the side, they actually start pimping out women and girls. And we've seen this whole new type of gang control trafficking begin to happen in different parts of the country when gangs realize this might be a new way to make money on top of the other ways that gangs make money. You've got a whole slew of federal cases that have happened of Eastern European run strip clubs where there's Eastern European women who are forced to dance in different strip clubs and they were either prosecuted as a labor trafficking case if they were forced to dance or a sex trafficking case if they were forced to engage in sex acts with different people. So when you take a step back and you look at this, you say, my gosh, this is an incredibly diverse sex trade. We've got parents and families. We've got domestic pimps in all these different places, street prostitution, online, truck stops, hotels, motels. We've got the whole Latino sex trade going on that exists in the United States. We've got the whole Asian sex trade that exists in the United States. We've got gangs beginning to get involved. We've got Eastern European organized crime getting involved. There is even actually some cases up in New York of, of very organized crime, kind of the mob, the Gambino crime family, beginning to engage in sex trafficking. So that's, that's a wide spectrum, and that's a serious issue to deal with when you have that many different subparts to it, all happening simultaneously, different parts in different regions of the country, subsets of that in different parts of the country, and a lot of those different parts of that network beginning to affect states like Nevada beginning to affect places like DC. And so these are, this is the benefit that we've learned of being on the national hotline, of absorbing that much information from law enforcement, absorbing that much information from NGOs nationwide, that this is an incredibly diverse kind of leviathan that we're beginning to look at. And then where does it become the difference between prostitution and sex trafficking is a very common question. And the difference becomes when those two buckets exist, when there are children involved, or when the adults who are involved are beginning to experience that forced fraud or coercion. And I can tell you that in all these different parts of the sex trade, whether or not it's the families, or the pimps, or the Latino networks, or the Asian networks, or the gangs, or the Eastern European networks, we've seen different examples of the force, the fraud, and the coercion start happening. The violence, the threats, the control. And that's where prostitution begins to differentiate into what is sex trafficking. So, that is what we're trying to talk about. That's what we're defining. That first bucket, the 100,000 kids in the sex trade, but that second bucket of how many adults are in the sex trade experiencing forced fraud or coercion nationwide, it actually has never been fully estimated. There isn't a single national estimate of how big the adult sex trafficking problem is in the United States. And there's not even a single national estimate of how big human trafficking is in the United States when you include the labor trafficking piece. It's been too big to study. Some people estimate in the hundreds of thousands. Some people go a little further and say potentially into, into the millions. But we're looking for a study to look at how big it is. And if maybe it's too big to study on the national scale, we could break it up into bite-sized pieces and study it in different statewide places or local places where we could say, we don't know how big it is in the country, but we do know how big it is in this state. We do know how big it is in this city. And so that's one of the things that we could look at. So, what do we do about all of this? Like this, this, is a, this is a very serious problem. It's real, it's massive in scope, it's incredibly diverse, it's incredibly adaptable. We know it's in communities nationwide. What can we do? So when you think about this 3P paradigm of pretend, prevention, protection, and prosecution, let's talk about prosecution first. So I'm kind of pivoting here from talking about the bad guys and now I'm gonna be talking about the good guys. So hopefully the rough part is a little bit over and we can talk about some hopeful things here so we're not all depressed because I'm sensing the energy in the room is kind of like, whoa. So let's get excited about the response that's starting to happen here because there are some good things happening. So on the prosecution front, 
You've got attorney generals getting involved. You've got last year, there was a whole attorney general's initiative beginning to spotlight this issue to say, how do we get more prosecutions? There's federal specialized units that exist in Washington, D.C. that focus only on prosecuting this crime. There's the Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit. There's the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section of federal prosecutors that are cracking down on this crime. You've got all of the U.S. Attorney's offices nationwide beginning to be trained on specialized human trafficking training so that they can have points of contact in that U.S. Attorney's Office specifically designated for these types of cases. And you could have more assistant U.S. attorneys bringing federal prosecutions with this very specific targeted human trafficking training. So we've got the state attorneys general's offices beginning to, to kick into gear. We've got these federal specialized offices kicking into gear. And you've got all the U.S. attorneys offices being trained to do more. There are human trafficking task forces being launched nationwide. There's one here in Las Vegas. There's almost over 30 nationwide where cities are launching human trafficking task forces, and the task force is looking at how to crack down on trafficking in that city. There's innocence loss task forces led by the FBI. They're specifically looking at that first bucket of child sex trafficking, and there's over 40 of those nationwide. There's all these state laws that have passed now. You have 49 states that have some form of criminal statute against human trafficking, including Nevada. Everyone except Wyoming, actually, so we're working on Wyoming to get a, a criminal statute there. But now you have 49 states that have defined human trafficking as a crime at the state level. And so now you can not only rely on federal prosecution, but you can begin having state prosecutions brought out of the state level or out of local district attorney's offices and county prosecutor's offices. And so there's now the whole state criminal justice apparatus that's starting to kick into gear. You have the uniform crime reporting that different states do. There's now a new box starting January 1, 2013 for states to report how many human trafficking cases they've brought. So we're gonna start collecting data in the FBI uniform crime reports to see how many of these cases happen, which now that there's a box, we can start counting it. And on the national hotline, which we do at Polaris, we're getting flooded with calls every day of people reporting tips and people saying, hey, I saw something. Hey, I think I encountered something. Hey, a victim of, tra of trafficking just reached out to me and said she's looking for help. And so we've been able to take over 65,000 calls on the national hotline. And of those 65,000 calls, when you sift through and look at the tips, we've been able to report over 2,300 leads to law enforcement of very kind of high likelihood, high indicator cases of trafficking that law enforcement then takes those leads from and begins investigating those cases. And we're referring those leads to the National uh, Human Trafficking Task Forces, to the AG's offices, to the federal government. And so there is a very serious law enforcement and prosecution component really beginning to take shape, which will be a deterrent effect on all of those trafficking networks that I just spent time describing. So the hope is there and folks are getting engaged and the entire wheels of the criminal justice system are starting to turn and beginning to focus a spotlight on this issue. So I think that first P of how to respond, the prosecution piece, is really beginning to happen. Then on the protection piece, the second P, how do we protect victims? People who, like Angie who've experienced this. There has been an outpouring of new nonprofits nationwide that have started to really look at this issue and you have lots of nonprofits that are here who are working on this issue uh, who know much more about the local issue than I do, but you have nonprofits that are saying, we're gonna work on that issue. Even, they might be a human trafficking specific nonprofit, or they might be a domestic violence nonprofit or a sexual assault nonprofit that's weaved this into their mission. And so you've got this new kind of cavalry of nonprofits that are starting to look at this issue, and it's been incredible to see the proliferation of all these nonprofits. Shelter for victims has grown. A few years ago, there was only about 50 beds for human trafficking survivors. And Polaris did a national count recently, and we found that there was 519 beds specifically designated for human trafficking survivors nationwide. And when you open up beds that are available to trafficking survivors, but not specific for them, we found over 1,900 beds. So now there's more of a shelter apparatus that's there. It's not enough, but it's getting there. Instead, it's a step in the right direction. There's federal funding to serve victims, federal grants. Now there's starting to be state grants to serve victims. You have the whole runaway and homeless youth field that works with runaway kids and kids that are homeless starting to look more at trafficking because we know that pimps are mostly targeting those runaway and homeless kids. 
And so the runaway and homeless youth field is saying, we've got a huge role to play because pimps are trying to recruit kids that are already vulnerable because they run away. And so how do we play a role in the response? You've got the child welfare system starting to say, how can we look at our foster care settings? How can we start looking at foster homes? Is there a correlation between kids that are already in state custody and kids that pimps are trying to recruit? And we realize that there is a correlation. I think someone, uh, I heard someone estimate once that there is about, you know, they did a study of a certain number of kids who were in the sex trade and they found that 74% of them had had some previous involvement in the foster care system or in the child welfare system. So in that subset, they saw a very high correlation. So there's a big role for the child welfare system to play and for foster care to play. Faith-based community is starting to step up. President Obama just launched a President's Faith-Based Advisory Council to look at this issue, where faith communities are starting to say, we have an incredible history in providing social services and providing care for communities, and how can we be part of the human trafficking fight, and how can we do more within the faith community to raise awareness, to look at demand issues, to look at social services issues, to, to, to raise awareness of the national hotline, what can we do and how can we be part of the fight? So you have the faith community stepping up. You also have these laws that are passing. And there's a great law that just passed in Nevada, the vacating convictions law, where you have a sex trafficking survivor like Angie, but when she got encountered by the police, she actually got charged with the crime of prostitution, even though she was being forced into it by a pimp. And so there's this, these new laws saying, maybe she should have a chance to vacate that crime off her record and get that crime expunged off her record so that she's not permanently being punished for something that she actually didn't do of her own volition. So you have a handful of states that have started to pass these vacating convictions laws, and Nevada is one of the first few states in the country to do that. And so another type of law, you have these safe harbor laws that say kids in the sex trade, if we're saying that they can't consent to commercial sex in the first place because they're not of age, how are we charging them with crimes of prostitution when they actually can't consent to that crime in the first place. How does that make sense? And so you have states starting to say, these kids who are in the commercial sex trade are victims. They've been exploited by an adult. They're not child prostitutes. There actually isn't such thing as a child prostitute. It, it's, it's kind of a, a figment of your imagination. Because how could a child be engaging in prostitution when they can't even consent to sex in the first place? It just doesn't make logical sense. So now you have about 10 states nationwide that are saying, let's look at these safe harbor laws and let's fix that in the law so that the law is consistent and says that kids under the age of 18, if they're victims of statutory rape and we can't actually see that they've consented to sex, how could they have consented to prostitution? And so we're looking at maybe a safe harbor law like that here in Nevada. So these are all part of the protection apparatus that's starting to happen. Stronger laws, stronger nonprofits, faith-based community, child welfare system, runaway homeless youth system, all those gears of the, of the protection apparatus starting to kick into gear for this issue. And then lastly, I'll round off with this third P of prevention. And the P of prevention, when you think about prevention, you say, how do we prevent this from happening in the first place? And there's supply side prevention strategies that look at the supply of victims, and there's demand side prevention strategies that look at what are the demand factors that's driving this. So when you think about the supply side, how do we actually prevent people from being vulnerable to trafficking in the first place? Maybe that involves better school and job training for women and girls in certain parts of the country, certain parts of the world. Maybe that involves doing more with prevention with runaway and homeless kids that we know are at risk for being recruited by pimps. And so what are some of those protective factors that we could put in place for runaway and homeless kids? If somebody is reporting that they've run away multiple times in a year, what are they running from? What's going on in the home? What's the trauma that they're experiencing? And how are pimps gonna jump on that? And so how do we get to them before the pimps do? And so these prevention supply side strategies, the US government came up with this idea and said, if anyone's coming to work in the United States on a visa, a J-1 visa or a guest worker visa or a H-2A farm worker visa, we should actually tell them about their rights and what human trafficking is before they get here to work so that if they begin starting experiencing human trafficking, they know what it is and know what to do about it. So this Know Your Rights pamphlet was created and it's being given to everybody coming to the United States on a visa to work. And it says, if this turns out to be a bad deal, 
If this isn't what you thought it was, if this job isn't what you thought it was, if you start experiencing forced water coercion, here's a hotline to call. And we've received over 3,000 calls from people reporting that something was beginning to happen in an exploitative job from that Know Your Rights pamphlet. So these are some supply side prevention strategies. Maybe it's jo better jobs, better education, worker rights education, all those different things. School curriculum. There's all these folks saying, well, why don't we roll out curriculum in high schools and in junior highs? So you've got a, a group that has folks here in, in Las Vegas, the Frederick Douglass Family Foundation, that's starting to look at school curriculum. There's about five or six different NGOs that are trying to build and write school curriculum to introduce high school kids to this issue. Maybe when they learn about the Underground Railroad and the Emancipation Proclamation, they're getting a historical lesson on slavery. You could talk about modern day slavery and you could weave that in. So you have these school curriculum that are happening. But then you have some demand side prevention strategies. And you have people beginning to talk about what are some demand side strategies to talk about. On the labor trafficking side, people are saying, what are our consumer habits? I have this, I have, you know, clothes that I'm wearing. Was slavery involved in any of these clothes? And the cup of coffee that I drank, was slavery involved in the creation of those coffee beans? Or the uh, electronics that I have, were there slavery involved in the creation of that? And so how can consumers start to demand I want to ask the question, where do these goods come from before I buy these? And demonstrating that there's a consumer will to companies for slave-free goods. And companies are sitting there listening and saying, if there's a consumer will for it, we'll begin trying to provide that to meet that consumer demand. And so it's a demand-side strategy to look at different types of labor trafficking there. And then there's some demand-side strategies to look at different types of sex trafficking. Guys having sex with kids. And you actually have the, the demand for children in the sex trade. And so you have new laws cracking down on men who are having commercial sex with minors and stronger penalties for getting caught having commercial sex with a minor. You have demand side strategies happening around educating men about what it means to buy commercial sex and what is the likelihood that you might be fueling some, peep, some pimp's profit incentive. Where the pimp is saying, I'm going to where the money's to be made. And the money's to be made by all these guys buying commercial sex. And so there's these whole different discussions beginning to happen. There's a website called demandforum.net, which is actually looking at what communities are doing to look at the demand for overall commercial sex and how pimps are actually trying to seize that demand. So those are some demand side prevention strategies. But the overall message I want to leave you all with, and I'm definitely out of time, so I'll, I'll stop it here. The overall message I want to leave you all with is this issue is quite real. It's quite prevalent, it's quite pervasive, it's in our communities. It's time for us to step up and acknowledge that. Just like the country went through an awakening period to talk about domestic violence, or to talk about sexual assault, or to talk about bullying, this is one of those things to recognize that this isn't in just some isolated place or in some isolated country. This is actually infecting all of the communities across the country, and it's in all of our communities. I can tell you from the National Hotline, it's, we've gotten calls from almost every, every city, every state. It's in all communities. So how can we acknowledge that? How can we be aware of it? How can we know the different faces of it? How can we know what we're up against as a field? And say, this is how we define it. These are the different types. But then how do we respond? And how do we be part of the response? And how do we build political will against it? How do we build community responses against it? How do we build national structures like the national hotline against it? How do we strengthen our laws against it? And I know we have some champions in the legislature here today who are gonna talk about the laws that they're looking at and the attorney general with the bill that she's put forth. So these are, these, this is where the hope comes from. We got an incredibly dark issue, but we have a history in this country of multiple movements against slavery, not only in the 1800s and the early 1900s and the mid-1900s, but in this modern-day movement through the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, kind of the fourth or third or fourth movement in this country against slavery or modern forms of slavery in these forms of human trafficking. And we know that this is something in our value system to fight against and to want to respond against when we hear about this great level of suffering. And what can we do to all be part of that solution? And I think that this summit is part of that solution. And creating this dialogue and spotlighting the issue is part of that solution. Movies like Not My Life are part of the solution. Getting survivors up to talk about their experiences and having survivors be leaders, those are part of the solution. President Obama just said this is gonna be an issue that's a priority for him. And he gave a major speech at the Clinton Global Initiative back in September, before he was reelected, 
talking about modern slavery. And it was one of the longest speeches that a president has given since Abraham Lincoln on the issue of slavery. So you're gonna have White House faith-based summits, White House technology summits. You have companies coming to, the, coming to the forefront and saying, we're tech companies, how can we do something to be part of this solution? Google's at the table, Yahoo's at the table, Microsoft's at the table. New types of companies like Palantir, data analysis companies are at the table. And so it's incredible to see corporations stepping up, business leaders stepping up, political leaders stepping up, the president of our country stepping up, citizens around the country saying, let's build the grassroots movement, the media stepping up like this movie, nonprofits like Polaris and others that are doing this work, and all of us are part of that, that solution. And so that's what I'd like to leave you all with today of how can we be part of that solution and how could the rest of today begin to explore that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. So again, thank you all for being here. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start to focus on defining this issue, sex trafficking locally. So you can see where it's happening, how it's happening, who it's happening to. And it's very, very powerful. And the woman we have speaking to us next, first of all, we're so fortunate to have her. And first and foremost, she's a mother. She's a mother of four children. She also happens to be a school nurse, and she was married to a federal agent. And her child was sex trafficked. So I think she is so brave, and I think she's saving so many people by sharing her story with all of us. So please help me welcome her, Andrea Swanson. I'm Andrea, can you hear me okay? Um, I just want to say something before I get into the remarks that I wrote. Um, I'm nervous, to say the least, but I've just had um, the Attorney General and Michonne Martin come up to me right before you guys came back in, and I almost feel like I'm a fighter in a ring, and they uh, kind of sponged me off and said, okay, next round's up. Um, we're going to bring it to the local side. He spoke so well on the national picture. And my job is to show you the local impact. And so, um, round two, local impact. And it's real. Um, so excuse me if I get emotional through some of this. Um, it's been a long journey. Um, but we are, we're working hard. So, again, I'd like to thank Michonne Martin for inviting me and the Attorney General to speak to you today. Um, I offer our family story and my daughter Hannah's story as a cautionary tale. Um, I wish I could be sitting out there where you are today, listening and learning, but I don't have that luxury anymore. What happened to my daughter can't be taken back. Her mind, her body, and her spirit have been altered for her whole life. Whether she is able to rehabilitate herself or not, she has been affected for the rest of her life. Um, our family has been dramatically affected by her forced experience. My goal in telling Hannah's story is to help expose this issue of human sex trafficking and ultimately educate the city, families, teenagers about the dangers that they could be seeing in their own homes and not have any idea what is going on. I'm here today in this room. It's filled with groups of people, government officials I'm hearing, law enforcement I know, lawmakers, clergy, faith-based um, organizations, um, nonprofit organizations. Um, you guys fight every day within your professional roles. I know most of you personally now, and I can tell you that you are all dedicated beyond your professional roles. Um, you work tirelessly to combat this plague and save our daughters. Not just because it's your job, but because it's your passion. Like someone said earlier, once this subject matter touches you, 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 you don't turn around and go the other way. You're forced to do something. Um, Vice's ability, Vice, Metro's Vice, their ability and their um, dedication can only be trumped by their true compassion and authentic concern for their victims. I tell you that and I mean that. And the victims' families. 
I offer my voice to all of you to help shine a light on this mounting local problem of human sex trafficking. I also feel that this room is filled with people working for me, for my daughter. And that makes me feel very thankful. And they do the same for every victim that they come in contact with. Detective Boffman of um, Vegas's pit team here, um, one of my personal heroes, has written a book off the street. It's a very accurate portrayal and a graphic illustration of the world that these girls are um, introduced to and the world that they live in. He dedicates his book, um, and I take that dedication and I say that everywhere I speak because I feel like it speaks directly to why we're all here. He says it's for our daughters not yet lost and those we can still save. That is why we are all here and that is why I want to help. My daughter was one of those girls. I won't be able to tell you anything new about sex, human sex trafficking. What I have to offer is my family's personal story with the hopes that you'll see we're pretty much like any other family out there. Dysfunctional and all. We were not perfect and we made mistakes and I'm learning in hindsight what the effect of missing certain things can have. That being said, we had no idea what was out there lurking for our daughter. We're the all-American family, family next door, uh, call us what you want. Um, you'll probably see yourselves in us. That is one of the main reasons I want you to understand the impact that it had. Um, if this evil can invade our intact and loving family, it can invade anyone's. Um, there was a, a, a little side story. There was a presentation I was giving about six months ago with Detective Bachman to very influential um, businessmen here in Las Vegas. That night, they invited their wives and their teenagers to come and listen, and so that's why I was asked to speak. I gave my talk, um, I was pretty new at giving the talk back then, but I gave it, I got through it, and Detective Boffman was up giving his speech, so I'm back in the crowd and my back is to most everybody, and I hear a man speak and ask Detective Boffman, what's wrong with these girls? I, I'm not buying it, there's something wrong with these girls, there's something wrong in the family, I, I just can't buy it. So I'm sitting there with my back to this man, fuming, thinking, you know, I just poured my heart out, gave my story, but, you know, remain calm, Andrea. So um, after it was over, he actually, this man came up to me, said a few prayers that I would not let loose on this man, and something came to me, and it stuck with me, and I feel like I need to tell you because I said to him, Sir, I forget his name, I should be offended by what you said, but I can't be. I can't be because I would have been you two years ago. I wouldn't have bought it. I wouldn't have believed that it could happen, and that's why I'm out here talking, because it did. So I won't take offense at what you say. I will use it as fuel to let me know that there's a lot of education that needs to be done around the city. So let me get to our story. Um, I am one of nine kids, grew up in Virginia in a military family. My dad was a naval officer. I'm the eighth of nine, that's where the mouth came from. <laughs> um, my mom always said I had a big mouth, had to have the last word, so I'm using that talent. Um, I did have a very um, tumultuous teenagehood myself. It didn't end in human trafficking back in 1981. It ended in a teenage pregnancy. Had my first daughter when I was almost 18. She's now 31. Um, maybe that's what makes me identify with some of these girls um, because I think at that stage in their lives, they're all looking for something. Thank God that this evil wasn't lurking out there when I was that age. Um, the world is a lot scarier place now, and these girls are teenagers, and our kids have more to deal with than we did. So I graduated high school with my parents' help, went straight to Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, graduated as a nurse in four years, 
and in the meantime had met my husband. Um, he was an uh, army officer, and we got married and had three more children. Um, Hannah's father was an army officer for 11 years. We moved to Las Vegas with the army in 1992. Hannah was one. He worked for Nellis Air Force Base as the army liaison officer. We fell in love with Las Vegas. We had never, we had moved from place to place, two years here, three years here, five years in Europe. We fell in love with Las Vegas for some weird reason. Four children, he's in the military, I didn't work, and Vegas bit us. He got out of the military while we were here in Las Vegas and joined the FBI from Las Vegas. We had to leave Las Vegas. He couldn't remain working here since he had joined from here. We went back to the East Coast, spent the next 13 years on the East Coast with the FBI, Philadelphia, Washington field office. He had a chance to be a supervisor here in Las Vegas, so he took it because we had loved Las Vegas. We came back to Las Vegas when Hannah was in eighth grade. Two of our children, uh, one of our ch children was already out of the house, so we brought three kids here. Hannah, our youngest, she was in eighth grade. Our kids, um, who's moving three kids to Las Vegas? Why are you doing that? We just knew that we were a strong family unit, we wanted to stay together, and that we could handle it. Our kids were our gifts. That's how we viewed them. We took great care in raising them to be happy, healthy, and productive adults. Um, Hannah's oldest sister, Kate, is 10 years older than Hannah, and she lives in Philadelphia. She runs a coffee shop in a suburb of Philadelphia, graduated from Temple University. Her brother, Raleigh, is the next born, and he was a soccer star here in Las Vegas, was the goalie for the UNLV soccer team, um, is a lieutenant in the Marines, is about to deploy to Afghanistan for the second time in two years. Her brother Jacob is a sergeant in the uh, 82nd Airborne, lives in North Carolina, has a wife and a baby on the way. These are all choices that they made for their lives and I commend them. They've made good choices and they're good citizens. Um, I feel like Hannah, I know Hannah's story is different than theirs. Um, we often wondered what would Hannah's choice be? What would Hannah's dream be? What would she choose and decide for her future? Our smart, beautiful, loving daughter had the world at her feet. Her dreams had no limits, but Hannah's story is much different than her brothers and sisters. During her senior year at Centennial High School, our daughter Mary Hannah was systematically and manipulated and stolen from my family. Hannah became one of this city's latest sex traffic victims at the hand of her boyfriend turned pimp. Our family had been blindsided. Remember that word, blindsided. Her dad was law enforcement, as I've described, the supervisor for the JTTF here in, the, in Nevada. I was a school nurse. We knew our daughter had some problems. She had had some problems since she was about 12 or 13 with the buzzword, and if it's not a buzzword, it should be for you, low self-esteem. She had it, we knew it, we were working on it. We were actively trying to get her through her rough times in high school. We went to counseling, um, we were talking with her, we weren't ignoring it is my point. We didn't know what was going on with her, but we knew it was bad. We went to drugs. Where else does a parent's mind go? We went to drugs. We went to the gutter. We knew Las Vegas could eat people up, and we tried to find out if that's what was going on. That was the worst thing that I could imagine um, as a mother having happened. My mind went to the gutter, as I say. Prostitution, human sex trafficking never crossed my mind. I didn't know that it should. I, it wasn't in my repertoire of things to look for. And you might have gathered a little bit about my personality by now. If it had, I would have looked into it. I did not know. It didn't come in my mind and leave and me not pay attention to it. I didn't know. That's where the blindsidedness comes from. Um, so unfortunately, we found out the hard way 
and it is in my repertoire, and my aim is to put it in every parent's repertoire of things to look for, and my aim is to educate the teenagers and the kids in junior high so that it never comes into their um, environment. Hannah was ultimately saved off the street by Detective Boffman, and for that we're forever indebted. Lots of hard work and long police hours went into building a case against her pimp, Kobe. We were lucky to have had the best, but I, didn't, I don't think it should be left up to luck. Um, I want the families in Las Vegas to be enlightened and empowered by the information that I have to share with them and that a lot of people in this room have to share with them. Because um, once vice comes to your door, it's too late. The damage has been done. We will survive and we will get our daughter back, I'm praying. She is off the street, but she's not back in our family. Her spirit and her soul and her life is still in jeopardy. I want to go over some of the signs quickly. You guys know them. Um, but most of these signs were sitting at my din dining room table, and I had no idea. On the surface, they all looked like a rebellious teenager. I can't tell you we didn't have some signs at our table that were bothering me. But I did not know that if you tie one sign to the other to the other, they point you directly to human sex trafficking. We called Lieutenant Hughes and Vice, my, my ex-husband did, and told him of some of the things that we were hearing and some of the things that uh, we thought were happening. Um, I'm going to take a few seconds and just tell you a story, and I, I might use a little bit of language that is offensive, but I want to offend you. Um, my daughter, my baby, trapped me in her bedroom when I confronted her, pushed me up against a wall, looked like a caged animal when I confronted her with a friend who was coming over to talk to me. Long story short, she finally admitted to her mother, my 17-year-old admitted to her mother that she, okay, what the fuck, mom, I trip-rolled. Get the hell out of my face. My heart dropped. I knew it was bad. I didn't know what a trick roll was. My daughter knew. This is her description. You find the drunkest motherfucker on the strip, Mom? You proposition him. He takes you to his room. You tell him to clean his ass. You steal his money when he's in there and you run. I did it, get out of my face. I was in shock to say the least, but I kept it cool, kept it cool. I called Kobe, her boyfriend, and said, do not come to this house. Um, I did not know his involvement. He was her boyfriend, I knew my daughter had troubles. I was naive, I didn't know his involvement. Don't come to this house, Kobe, something's going on. Yes, ma'am, Miss Swanson. Yeah, Hannah has been acting a little weird lately. I, I get you, no problem. Sweet talk, always in my face. You're probably old enough to know what an Eddie Haskell is. He was an Eddie Haskell. To my face, sweet as pie. To Hannah and out in the public with her, abusive and manipulative. Anyways, that night happened. Six o'clock in the morning, I turned their cell phones off because Kobe has a cell phone on my family plan because he had been in prison before, long story, and we were trying to help him rehabilitate his life, trying to give him every resource my family had to, to make himself a productive citizen. So he had a, a phone on my family plan. I cut the phone off. Verizon said, that'll be $800. Cut the phone off. Something's going on. When my daughter found out that that phone and Kobe's phone had been cut off, she looked terror-stricken. That's their lifeline, I've come to find out. Anyways, Detect uh, Lieutenant Hughes was informed. She's told my ex-husband that she would look into the situation. Two or three days later, she catches us in Costco on the phone 
and says, I have some pictures I want to send you, and let me know if these are your daughter. Um, one picture comes by on my husband's phone, and I say, I think that's Hannah. It looks like her, but this is too important not to be sure. Second picture, uh, I'm pretty sure that's Hannah. She's posing weird, she's dressed funny, but I think that's Hannah. But I'm not saying yes yet, not doing it. Third picture, same reaction from me. I sit down on my huge toilet paper <laughs> roll in Costco when the fourth picture comes over. The fourth picture is the same picture that pops up on my phone when her number calls me. I said, that's Hannah. And she said, if that's Hannah, then all four of these girls are your daughter. And she had taken those pictures off of that page. We knew we had a problem. Let me go through some of the sites quickly, and I'm going to focus on the low self-esteem. Our daughter, starting at 12 and 13, started to show signs of low self-esteem. This can't be overemphasized, in my opinion. What could low self-esteem do, though? Back then, I thought, you know, what could it do? It's not going to do as well in school. You know, I'm not saying that it was not significant, but it didn't know the magnitude that it could come to. She wasn't going to reach her potential. I knew these were problems. She wasn't going to lead a corporation someday, maybe due to this low self-esteem, trouble reaching her personal goals. We never knew its impact on making Hannah an identifiable target for these predators. They could detect her just like a child abuser detects its victim, and she was manipulated and groomed because of it. She had school problems, teacher problems, friend problems, workload problems, expectation problems, just like any teenager would have. Um, so that by itself didn't point me to human sex trafficking. She had early sexual experiences. I'm learning that a lot of these girls up into the 90% can have some kind of sexual abuse in their histories. My daughter didn't have that. She's, you know, she's not in that category. She had early consensual, in her opinion, sexual experiences, early to the age of 12 and 13. To me, that's rape. To me, she proceeded through her teen years with the persona of a rape victim. And to me, that prevented her from advocating for herself and falling prey to these men. Her, like, okay, so those two things don't exactly point you to sex trafficking. Her language became abusive. Her terminology started to change. They did call themselves wifey and husband and daddy. I heard it. I didn't understand it. I thought it was stupid, but it was a teen thing. Let it go. It's not hurting anybody. The game. I heard it. I heard these things. Didn't know what they meant. Changes in her dress. She had Abercrombie, she had Fitch. What are your kids asking y'all for? That, she didn't wear it. She wore seductive, cheap clothing. Her change in her hair and her nails, she had always maintained them, but I wasn't maintaining them anymore. I don't know where she was getting the money. She had a preoccupation with money. Her, her dad and I made a good living. She was not hurting. She got what she needed. She didn't get excess, but she got what she needed. But all of a sudden, she had a preoccupation with money. She worked a legitimate job, she still does, and she never had her paycheck money. Where's your money, Hannah? Mom, I need some money. I don't have any. Where's your paycheck? Whatever, Mom, shut up. She never had any money, and she had a preoccupation with it. Where was it all going? Kobe. She had a tattoo. She was 16, went to a garage, and got a tattoo plastered on the back of her shoulders, up her neck. Kobe designed it. And all for the purpose of money. Somebody last night at a presentation we gave asked me, what is the purpose of this? Why are they doing this to these girls? Why do they enjoy this? And the person that was speaking with me and I, in tandem, we didn't plan it, said money. It's all for money. They're making it off our daughter's backs. That is the focus. Don't forget it. It is not for anything else. They know how to gain the control and trust of these girls. 
um, by skilled manipulation, and these girls are oblivious. I equate these girls to addicts. I really do, and it's not just a passing fancy that I say that, they're addicts. They are addicts for the love and attention that these men give them. What does an addict do for their drug? What do they do? They will do anything, including selling their body. Um, I want to tell of one, I now close after this story. I want to tell of one instance when Lieutenant Hughes and Detective Bachman came to my home for the first time. Hannah's dad was leaving for Yemen. He was going to be the legal attache in Yemen for a year. About a week before um, we found out, about a week before he left, we found this out. This came to a head. He was going to be out of town for a year, and I needed a plan. I said, leave, go, do what you got to do. I just need to know what to do if, if things happen. So Lieutenant Hughes and Detective Bachman came to my house. Detective Bachman walked through the door with a three-inch three binder with Kobe's name on the front. I'm like, I'm still oblivious to his involvement. What's going on? So they tell us we have reason to believe that Kobe is her pimp. I'm looking like a deer in headlights. I don't know what to say. And I describe to them how every night I would text him, I love you, come home when you want. Every morning I would do the same thing. And I didn't get a response the night before. And they said, you didn't get a response because your daughter's sitting in jail as we speak. I had no idea. She solicited a police officer last night and was thrown in jail for prostitution. It doesn't sound like out of what I've told you that that would be the thing that got me. Not that she was a prostitute, not that she was in jail. The fact that she hadn't called her mother for help killed me. No matter what the troubles the teenagers go through, no matter what happens when the going gets tough, I expected that she would call me. But these men steal the positions of authority and trust in, away from the parents and away from their families and insert themselves into that. Who did she call? She called Kobe. What did Kobe do? Nothing. I didn't understand that. He's a businessman, right? Why doesn't he want her out making more money? Come to find out these guys want him arrested at least once. It's part of the package of the manipulation. So, baby, you are a prostitute now. It's on paper. You're a prostitute. You have a record. Your family don't want you back. You guys don't. No other guy's going to want you. Stick with me. So that was the dynamic that was going on, and I've learned it, and it hurt me. That is one of the things that's hurt me the most, is that position in her life has been taken from me and her dad. So um, also, he tricked me, too. I fell for him, too. I didn't fall in love with him, but I bought his story. I tried to help him rehabilitate, and I have been victimized by him also, and it's hard to deal with. In closing, I'd like to just talk a little bit about, you know, you've heard the story, there's a lot more specifics to the story, and I do kind of get into that when I go to smaller events and talk about it. Um, and I'm welcome, or I'm, I'm happy to come anywhere if you'd like me to speak. But I'd like to talk about what we can do um, my goal is to give these talks to people who don't know about human sex trafficking. I know you guys do, um, and educate them and empower them. Um, but everybody has a part in this. There's all sorts of people who are doing all sorts of wonderful things um, to help solve this plague. But mine is a mother. Um, there's people who are in law enforcement working tirelessly. There's, there's nonprofits working. There's shelters working. There's everybody working, and they will continue to work. Um, but there's also, and so I, I look at that as a spectrum. Um, actually, not a spectrum. It doesn't build. It's just a line of people. I feel like mothers, parents, people who are intimately involved, 
and have a connection. Victims are on one end, law enforcement, nonprofits, all the organizations in the middle. They're going to work, they're going to work, and they're going to work. And then I also feel like there's lawmakers on the other end. Um, and we all have our part in solving this problem. Um, the organizations can work till the cows come home. There are going to be victims. Hopefully there won't be as many. If the other two ends, we'll start bringing it in. Um, we need to have education. We need to have enlightenment and power. That is where I feel like I want to spearhead. And so we're going to stop the supply of victims on this end. But we also have need to have laws on the top end to bring it in from there. We need laws to help these victims. We need laws to help um, make more strict punishments for the pimps, for the Johns. We need laws to help give law enforcement tools to help make these cases. We need all sorts of laws, and I know they're going to be featured here later, but they're important and they're a piece of the, the solution to this problem. Um, with the laws, one of the laws I'm told is stricter punishments and more time in prison. Like low self-esteem, I wanted to feature that word. I want to feature the word time. We need time. These girls and victims need time away from their, their victimizers to rehabilitate themselves. Michonne Martin um, describes it as they need time to self-actualize. I, as a mother, describe it as I need time to get my baby back. I need time to teach her that there are alternatives to his love. I need time to bring her to, to get her to consent to go to counseling. I need time to get her to focus on maybe going to college and getting an education. I need time so that her spirit can start to dream again. Um, we need time. And the way to get that time is to keep these victimizers in prison longer. Um, let me just update you quickly on Hannah. Hannah was taken off the streets in July 2010, I believe. Her story is continuing. She has not, to my knowledge, been back out on the streets. But she has been to the prison every Friday to visit her boyfriend. She has sent him money. She has done his deeds on the outside, his administrative things. I sat back for two and a half years just biting my lip. Well, for two years, because for six months after she came out, I wanted to shock her out of this. Just like I had been shocked, I wanted to shock her. Hannah, he sold you. He doesn't love you. Who could sell their girlfriend? It was the exact wrong thing to do. I've learned that. I've learned to go the opposite direction. Love my daughter, give her a place to come and talk to, not press her. So what I focus on is Hannah, and I pretend like Kobe doesn't exist. Um, but that did not break the tie. It is still strong. Six months ago, Hannah started to get angry, anxious, um, and I didn't understand what was going on. I talked to Stacy Kramer from the Salvation Army, and I told her how Hannah was acting, and she said, where's Kobe? I said, well, he's coming out in a couple months. She goes, Hannah's feeling it. She's feeling it. She's starting to act out. Kobe's release date was December 27th, 2012. Two weeks ago, Hannah now lives in a weekly cross street from the Texas with him. She swears he won't put her out again. I'm not going to do that, Mom. Don't worry. We just needed some money back then. Don't worry about it. Since, OK, yes, he didn't hurt me. Just, just I got to get out of here. I can't take this. I started emailing, texting all the people in the audience that got that email and asked for prayers. Thank you. I said, hallelujah. He showed his colors fast. She's coming home. She left him for about three hours, and she went back. So I learned a tough lesson not to ride the yo-yo with her up and down. Yesterday was my birthday, 
and she consented to have lunch, dinner with me last night, and we were talking, and she's drink. she is now 21, just turned 21. She's drinking a, a Long Island something, liquor upon liquor upon liquor upon liquor in this glass, downing it. She's so anxious, she self-medicates with um, alcohol and marijuana, to be frankly, to be frank with you. She said, I, I, it's over, it's over. I'm going to go tell him it's over. This is my dinner last night. And I'm like, okay, don't get excited. Don't say anything that's going to make her mad. Just listen, just listen. She told me he's got other girls around while she's at a 14-hour shift. He's hanging with his old pal, Eric, known pimp. And she didn't feel like she needed to take what kind of stuff that she used to. And I'm thinking, this is it. This is it. She's going to leave. She went back to the weekly and Eric was over and I asked her if I could call the police. I didn't want her walking into a situation with two pimps and her saying she's leaving, knowing what could happen. Shut the hell up, mom. You're over dramatic. Whatever. I'm going. I'm good. You've been drinking, Hannah. Don't go. Don't go. Don't go. I'm good, mom. Shut up. You're annoying me. I texted her last night. Asked her, how are you? Do you need me to pick you up? How are you? We worked it out, Mom. We're going to bed. Love you. Night. It's going to be a yo-yo with me and her, and with her in life. And we need you guys to help us. Hannah has a family who is willing to help and who still loves her and accepts her. Most of these girls don't. I'm not out here for Hannah. We're, I'm a handle Hannah. And I appreciate the help that I've been receiving. I'm out here for the girls who don't have somebody to talk for them and on their behalf. So, being one of nine, the big mouth, last word, I'm asking you to join me and others in this fight. And let's give the families of Las Vegas and this city the last word on these men. Thank you. Well, I will say it again. You are saving people. You are saving people. So thank you, Andrea. Okay, I also want to continue with our dialogue about defining the problem locally. And then we'll move on this afternoon. I promise you there's going to be hope in the room. We're going to figure out how to do this together. But I want to introduce now a crusader in this area, a champion in this area, and one of my favorite people in the world. That is Lieutenant Karen Hughes. She is Lieutenant of the Vice Unit, and she has committed her life, pretty much for every waking moment, for every breath. And she's fairly extraordinary. So she's going to come to find it for us, give us some statistics, and talk more about it. Please come up and please help me welcome her, Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a great audience. Uh, it did my heart good when I walked in and saw all the faces. A lot of you I am working with right now, and uh, I, I thank you for your tireless efforts. Um, we've got a long road ahead of us. Uh, it's a fight that, Brad, you said it so eloquently. Um, you, you, you guys get it at Blair Project, you really do. Um, I want to talk about the local scene now. Because what Brad spoke about, I kept saying, uh, yeah, check mark, uh, check mark, uh, check mark. Uh, what Brad talked about this morning is spot on to what this issue is all about. And, um, the signs and the symptoms at the national level are a little, a little bit similar to what we're dealing with here in Vegas. And because of our unique landscape, this is a beacon for these pimps. Um, there are so many different aspects of human trafficking uh, that we could spend days upon days talking about all the different tentacles. Uh, so I have focused just specifically on one small category although it tugs at all of your hearts, and that's the juveniles. And that's why I've asked Andrea to join the fight. Where are you at, Andrea? Did you run away? Um, back when we dealt with Andrea's case, um, that was a, that's a tough one. But uh, when we spoke to Andrea, and uh, we dealt with all the issues that were going on in that case, uh, I told her her story is unique and she's not just a statistic sometimes we get caught up in the numbers 
And I told her her face, her story, her existence, her, it, it is what Vegas um, can relate to. And so you heard her story. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. There is no short success story for these young girls. There's just not. And the young boys as well, because there's a few of them as well. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about numbers, because I know people are always like, how big is this issue? But I will qualify that. The numbers that I talk about are the faces and the stories that my unit deals with. That is not the entire population. It's just the ones that we identify. And when we've identified them, it's already too late. What about all the ones that are out there that law enforcement has not had contact with? What about the ones that have eluded um, recognition by either their families, uh, their friends, their teachers, their counselors, whatever, wherever they're plugged into life. If somebody has not noticed the plight that they're in, um, they are yet to be counted. And hopefully they won't be counted by my unit. Andrea does talk about one thing, you don't want us to be involved in your lives. You don't, because then it's too late. And their recovery is its a significant journey for them. It changes them forever. And I will leave all of those discussions for the wonderful panel that they've got this afternoon uh, that provide the services because they are truly a group of people that their hearts are in this every day and they breathe the same air as one of them. Esther, you'll meet Esther later. Esther breathes the same air, that's what she describes. And it is true and sometimes you want to run away from it because they disappoint, just like Andrea talked. You know, having those expectations that they're always going to make the right choice doesn't come with one decision. They make the wrong choices a whole lot more than the right. And there's lots of folks out here in this audience, and I will never draw attention to you, but you're our survivors, and when you join these fights, you also put a strong voice that message says thanks for being here and I want to bring special recognition because I just get to stand up here and talk the talk but I got two sergeants that are both here that walk the walk every day and I want to acknowledge both of them they're great guys I get choked up because I tell you these guys work their tail ends off uh, Don Horner stand up Don. And Adrian Diaz, stand up, Adrian. Both of them have a team of detectives. Dawn uh, has the team of detectives that comes out of that bucket that Brad was talking about, uh, that they deal with all of the adult uh, victims of sex trafficking. And when they finally step forward, because they're at their final straw, Dawn is the one that takes those calls in the middle of the night. Um, AJ leads a team that does all of the juvenile uh, domestic trafficking, and uh, his team works endless as well. Both of our teams are associated with task forces, and we work uh, with the federal government and federal entities to make sure that we've got everything in place to put these bad guys away. So I do want to acknowledge both of them. They're, they're hard uh, workers, they're tireless, and I love them to death. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, well, the local landscape. Uh, because unique to Vegas is the glitz and the glamour, and it really is um, what attracts these pimps to Vegas. It's the money. We have a lot of discretionable spending here with our tourists, and we want them to spend their money, but certainly not in this, in this avenue. Um, I hear over and over, anybody that's worked vice for a day um, will tell you they hear people always poo-pooing uh, prostitution as you know, just two consenting adults behind closed doors, having sex, big deal. Who's, who's going to count the money? Well, the cases we stay, that we see, don't even look anything close like that. They're the broken bodies, they're the scars, they're the tattoos, they're the, the lives that are shattered and the families that go along with it. So, victimless. Those of you that are still thinking or have friends that think it's victimless, I can give you all kinds of graphic details to show you. There's a whole lot of victims um, in this fight, that's for sure. 
So the criminal enterprises are behind this. Uh, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff. Uh, it'll come up on the screen, but Brad already spoke to it. And those that are in this room are very educated already. Uh, there are very good criminal organizations that are attached to this. Why? The dollar sign. It is very, very, very profitable. The demand, it's endless. Why? Because we've got so many vulnerable girls out there and young boys that are easy prey. And when they become an easy prey, uh, an easy target, they make it very, very easy uh, to traffic. And we, unfortunately, have a steady stream of customers that are waiting for that. It all is about supply and demand. When we do reverse sting operations and we put an undercover female out there, it's like a drive-through. And that is sad to see, but it happens. Um, the signs, we've already spent a little bit of time talking about the signs, but it's obvious to those of us that have that trained eye, and hopefully as these types of summits and um, forums take place across our community, people will become more aware of what those signs are. And when you put them together, it's hard to ignore. Uh, not just any one of them standing alone, but when you put them together, you can't ignore them. And if you don't have the answers, then pick up the phone and call somebody that will make those, those phone calls. Uh, Brad gave you the National uh, Human Trafficking Hotline, and all of those calls that are about Nevada or specific to Las Vegas come to us, we deal with those. If it's a, a, a human trafficking tip line that's not what you're gonna do, pick up the phone. You know, our dispatchers are trained in human trafficking, believe that or not, um, and they know who to call. So we want to educate the community about what those signs are, and we want you to pay attention. Whether you're in your professional business and you encounter somebody that may be a victim, or you're a parent, or an uncle, or an aunt, or you have a family member somewhere in your close circle that you start seeing those signs about. We want you guys to talk about it. <coughs> Brad already talked. I keep saying Brad, 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 but boy, he had a great presentation. Um, force fraud coercion. Remember that bucket, the two buckets? The first two buckets are what we deal with every day up on my unit. There is no, um, the, the victims that are under the age of 18 are victims. Period. End of story, it's that simple. The ones that are over 18, we have to be able to show a lot more um, than just their age. And that's where the forced fraud coercion comes into play. And there are a whole host of ways that we build that evidence. Um, and it comes into play in the very courtrooms that many of you might end up getting impaneled as a juror. So I look at you guys as all potential jurors so that when those bad guys get graded through our courts and we've got our best DAs that are fighting these very difficult cases, you look, at, you look at those signs and you look at that evidence and you go, wow, I know that these are, this is the way pimps operate. You know, we want that awareness out there. The victims, juveniles, single largest demographic population that they recruit. Why? They're vulnerable. They don't have life experiences. They don't have the skill sets that we have as we make better choices when we get grow older. Sometimes we're still making them late, late, late life, but um, these kids are really uh, an easy population to prey on. And then add all the other issues that go along with becoming a teenager. You know, uh, when I was 15, I probably looked like an alien to my parents. And I know when my daughter was 15, I thought she was, you know, reincarnated from, you know, the devil. I'm like, where did this girl come from? You know, trying try to figure out what is going on up here and in here that is making them so weird. It, it is because of that that makes them so vulnerable. Um, talked about the lack of ability to make decisions. They don't make the decisions at that age. That's why parenting is so important in your homes when these kids are going through those uh, difficult times, the acceptance they're gaining. They want to gain acceptance. They want to be a part of something. And we hope that they don't make the choice to be a part of the bad something. The pimps in social media right now are glorified. Um, hopefully uh, the pimp, I call the pimp word, um, a four letter P word. Uh, and it is a four letter word in our arena. It is a four letter word. It should be in the sex trafficking communities that are anti-sex trafficking. Um, that pimp word is glorified. It's glorified in movies. It's glorified uh, everywhere you look. 
When our kids flip on uh, social media, that's what they see, the glory. And we have got to take that and change that uh, to where we do not have kids growing up idolizing those that are involved in a very ugly uh, lifestyle. These are the areas that we police most frequently. When we stop policing them, we do not recover kids. If I don't have a team to put out to police the streets, we don't recover kids. Um, I know it's controversial to say that we arrest these girls, but right now we don't have any other choice. And right now, that is the only way I know that if I pull that girl off the street, I know that at least there's a whole group of people when she gets down to juvenile hall, they're gonna say, wow, okay, here's another one, and let's start working. But if we're not out there policing these streets, policing the hotels, uh, working those venues within the motels, and most importantly, the internet now with a gazillion and one different websites to draw from, we're not gonna recover nearly the ones that we already have. Our efforts, I'm gonna throw my numbers at, at you, and I just cranked these out um, just the other day. So far, um, our unit, and when I say our unit, our police department has been policing this area. This is not a new thing, folks, since 1994. I don't know where all the hoobra was back in 94, but I'm glad it's here today. So pat yourself on the back for making it and for being one of the crusaders. 2229 was my number um, as of December 31st. But we had two more the first two days. So it's endless. 107 of them uh, were kids. And the vast majority, as you can see, were girls. We did have three young boys. So 61% from Nevada. My statistics for last year were 74% from Nevada. It's gonna change this year from 2012, it was 61%. It is too high. Where are our pimps getting our kids? Here, in our communities, in our schools. That's why we're having these types of awareness seminars and summits, so that we can bring awareness to the decision makers in these kids' lives, so they recognize the signs. We have got to turn this tide, we really do. Here's my statistics from a, from a race standpoint. What do you guys see? We've got our minority kids right up there at the top, don't we? And when Brad talked about the Asian brothels, and he talked about the, the, the Latino uh, residential brothels, guess what, we police those too. And he's 100% right, you better have an exclusive pass to get in. And when you do get in, you're gonna find very young girls there. So we've got, 64% that are African American, 23 Caucasian, 11 Hispanic, and then 2% Asian or how they identify as else. Those are our 2012 numbers, all right? 91%. Um, I don't want you guys to go running out there and say we've got, you know, all of these kids or 11 year old kids involved in sex trafficking. Maybe in some communities, not in this community, not in this year. 91% of them are between 16. 17, 15, 16, and 17, up till they're 18 years of age. That is the audience that we need to target. 4% involved in gangs, or affiliated or associated with gang activity. That is going up, okay? We need to be aware of the trends in this arena. Gangs are getting involved, why? The dollar. The gangster pimp, they are notorious in my world, um, but they are very highly regarded on the streets by other thugs and uh, people that want to be a part of something migrate that way. Thank goodness we have got a phenomenal group of workers in this community that are focused on gangs and rehabilitating that gang mindset. Pastor Troy Martinez leads the charge and so many others um, and they do a phenomenal job. We've got to change uh, the way we're we're indoctrinating these kids and allowing them to just kind of form their own associations because once they get into these gangs, they're too gonna to be pimped out. We had a young girl that was just barely 19, had a young, young baby, um, less than a year old, uh, turned out by a Latino uh, gang, and they were involved in identity theft and mail fraud and guns and drugs. Prostitution was one component. <coughs> And thank goodness that's a federal case, and thank goodness we got a conviction. But the victims are left in the wake. Suicidal, drug dependent, new moms. You guys can do the math. Um, the vulnerabilities. I'm just gonna put them up there. You guys can see them. There we go. Uh, lack of supervision. 
They're looking for conflict. So if your kids at 15 and 16 are having conflict in the home, which they all are, even in the best of our homes, um, that conflict creates an opportunity and a window for these guys to come in and create that association. Be conscientious of that. Sexual and physical abuse, absolutely. Um, those are all precursors in many of these girls' lives. Not all of them, but in many of them. Emotional and physical needs, absolutely. And the adolescent changes that occur during that time period in their lives is absolutely critical. Uh, the guys are looking for that. Once you guys see a pimp, they don't all look like pimps, but the ones that we see, the ones that we uh, investigate, the ones that are involved in a career in pimping are going to have certain means. They're going to dress the dress, they're going to dress very well. They're going to use things that are easy for people to associate with for success. And that's a, that's a hook. These young girls that are influenced by that, wow, he's driving a nice car. He's got some money in his pocket. I want that. And that's what we're seeing as well. The master mani manipulation is, it goes without saying, these guys can talk the talk. They are sweet uh, to these girls initially. And when they roll out their game and they start turning these girls out, that changes. They try to desensitize the girls about sex. And they do it in so many different ways. Um, one of the comments that we hear over and over is, you know, you're already sexually active. You're already giving it away. Why not just sell it? You're making some money doing it. Um, all manipulators. Um, you're going to see sudden changes. Andrea spoke to all of these. Their material possessions become very, very important to them. Their perception of their relationship. Y'all remember that puppy love that first time? You know, eat, drink, sleep, breathe. That first love. And some of these girls indicate um, those kind of signs. Most of our pimps have much bigger uh, age gap than the girls that they're exploiting. So the age difference is, is significant. They do dress provocatively, not because that's the way they start off, but that's the way the pimps want them to dress. Andrea mentioned that, she saw it. They're gonna make reference to uh, sexual situations. They're probably gonna have conversations that are uh, inappropriate for their age group. They're gonna say things that you go, whoa, mm, that's, that's not a good thing. You shouldn't be using that term. Uh, drug use, pretty prevalent in this population. They're going to self-medicate, they're going to smoke the joint. Many, many, many of them do. They're preoccupied with the new boyfriend. Boyfriend is their pimp. May even be listed in their phone as the boyfriend. Um, tattoos, when I talked to uh, Andrea's husband and I asked him all, I was going through my list. And I said, Rod, does she have a tattoo? Well, as a matter of fact, Karen, she does. Now, LaShawn is actually a Nevada native. Now, she left the state for a while, and we're glad that her eyes were opened and she saw the light. And she That's came right. back and joined us and brought all of her talent with her and all of her energy. Um, she, prior to coming back to Nevada and working at the Attorney General's office, she worked at the San Francisco uh, District Attorney's office for over a decade as a prosecutor specializing in crimes against women and children including, but of course attorneys have to add this, but not limited to, uh, <laughs> homicide, sexual assault, and sex trafficking. And I can attest to you with my work with Michonne that she, through her efforts at the Attorney General's office, has not left the fight for the victims in our state who are the most vulnerable. Please join me in welcoming Michonne Martin. So you've been hearing from me from all day long. So now we're getting to the hope part. I hope everybody is feeling that. Um, so I want to talk about the legislation and what we're doing. And uh, Russell Smith is right. I was a prosecutor for a very long time, and I still, I still feel it. And so this piece, this initiative, this legislation is so very near and dear to my heart. And I will tell you, when I was handling these cases, sex trafficking cases, these were the most difficult cases I've ever prosecuted. That's including homicides, including rape cases. These were the most difficult. And I'll tell you why. These victims were broken in a way that I had never seen before. I'd handled child sexual assault cases. These victims that I called my babies were even more broken because many of them had been molested as children, come from broken homes, anything you can imagine. 
and then these pimps come into their lives. And I will tell you, when we talk about this subject, it really is a marriage between child sexual assault and domestic violence, as far as I'm concerned. Because what we're seeing is these pimps have learned to groom our children, our women, our boys, in a way that I say it's grooming on steroids, so sophisticated. Tell them how much they love them so that they find worth and value, and they'll do anything for them. You've heard all about that today, so I won't reiterate it. But I just want to tell you from my perspective that truly this is now the fight that we do need to have. We did it in domestic violence. We did it in child sexual assault. We did it in all these arenas where it was all in the dark, nobody talked about it. And look as a community what we did, how we changed it. And we need to do it here. And so I am so lucky to be able to be a part of this. And my attorney general is the reason for it. She has jumped into this fight. And I said earlier today that I think she's fearless, and boy do I. Because what she did is she brought everyone together to start talking about this very, very difficult subject. I was watching everybody today, listening to the stories, Andrew is speaking today, some of the videos, and I could see everyone tearing up and starting to really feel what this is about. And General Masto wasn't afraid of that. And she knew that she needed to also jump into this fight and help. And so this is what we're doing. She brought everybody together. We talked to law enforcement prosecutors, service providers, you saw all the people here, uh, people in the community, interfaith organizations, anyone and everyone that we could talk to about this issue and ask them, what needs to happen? How can we help? What can we do? And I will tell you, what everybody said is we need tougher laws. We need to change the laws. That's what needs to happen. You heard from Bradley Miles this morning that there's different pieces, the three Ps, prevention, prosecution, protection. But if we don't have tough enough laws, that prosecution piece, then we can't save all those victims because as you heard, it's a revolving door. These pimps will get out of jail, and what do they do? Find more victims. Who are those victims? Those are our women, our children, our boys. So what are we gonna do? When we talk to law enforcement and prosecutor's offices and the public defender's office, we wanted all those voices in it. What needs to happen? And they said, we need to be talking the same language. You know, we hear a lot of different terms around this. Currently in Nevada, we have a pandering statute. And you heard reference to it earlier today when the panel was talking about pandering. Well, that's what it was called when I was handling these cases. And I would say at a dinner party, although it wasn't very much fun at dinner parties, what kind of case I was handling, and people would look at me and say, pandering? No idea what you're talking about. So that was the first issue, was wait a second, we need to raise awareness so people really know what we're talking about. So in this legislation, that's what we're intending to do. So we went about trying to figure out what is the word that captures this? What's the phrase that fits the crime that we are looking at? So again, we look to law enforcement, we look to all the other states, we look to Polaris Project, who has been invaluable in drafting this legislation. And what we found out is the term sex trafficking, everybody knows what that is. A picture comes to mind. You understand there's a victim in that. It's no longer the case where years ago, had we talked about this, people would think prostitute, throw away, we don't care. That's no longer the case. Now when we hear sex trafficking, these are the images you see that you saw today. And so we looked to the Department of Justice. What is their definition of sex trafficking? So we can all speak that same language, so we can all collaborate. Again, collaboration, collaboration, <coughs> collaboration. That's the way that we're gonna win this fight. And so they have a definition of sex trafficking that really broadens it and modernizes the definition. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna change that pandering statute to sex trafficking. The language in that statute is gonna reflect the change in times. No longer are we gonna be labeling our victim a prostitute. You will see words in there saying, engaging in prostitution. Well, those are action words, so that we are not labeling and re-victimizing. That's what you're doing at that moment, but let's move beyond. Let's get you to be a survivor. So broadening that definition. And you heard Bradley Miles speak this morning. When it comes to children, it's a different case. We're talking about that pot, those two pots. The one with children in it, the law is going to be different. So the law here in Nevada, you don't have to prove force, violence, coercion. Why is that significant? I will tell you. Prosecuting these cases, I would have you know, my babies come to me. These pimps were so sophisticated, especially with our children. They didn't have to threaten them. They didn't have to hit them. They didn't have to do any of those things, but tell them they love them, and baby, please go do this for me, and they did. 
and we couldn't capture that crime. So in Nevada, just as in the you know, Department of Justice has done it, many states across the country are now moving towards that. We don't have to prove force or fear with our children. And so we're really capturing that conduct, that pot. Now what about for adults? There was some discussion about that. How do you make the distinction? And we want to be very clear. The way you make the distinction is force, violence, coercion. But there is that added element that takes it up a notch. That is something very, very different where we do have a victim. So what else was gonna make a difference? What else did General Masto hear from everybody that we spoke to? Everyone said, the penalties have to be greater. So we looked at that and we wanted to take a very reasonable, very reasoned approach to that. And believe me, the prosecutor in me, I was fighting myself, going, you know, let's go all the way to the top. We wanted to make sure that it was reasonable and that we were thinking through that process. But why is increasing penalty significant? Why is that important? I think we talked about it today. And I used to think about it on every prosecution I had. I would be looking at my victim, one of my children, trying to figure out the value of that case. What is that case worth? And I always thought, I want her to be able to become self-actualized. I want her to be in a place in her life that she is out of this life and never has to deal with this perpetrator again, so she can be. And we heard Andrea's story, and I don't think there is anything more poignant. Her pimp is back out, and she's with him, because our laws weren't tough enough. And so that's the reason that that is so important. But again, we really thought through it, so we looked again at what the Department of Justice is doing. What's the federal government doing? What is the sentencing? And it is very similar to that. We also said we're only going to go up one sentencing level. So instead, for an adult woman, we'll use that as, a, as an example, it used to be the state of the current law, not used to be, with your help, I hope it's used to be, it is one to four years, one to five years in prison, but almost everyone was getting probation, so that revolving door was happening. So we're increasing at one sentencing level to a category B felony. So that's three to 20 years. So the prosecutor still has discretion to figure out what, what the value of that case is, but we can protect so many of our victims by taking that one pimp, that one perpetrator, off the street for long enough that it will make a difference. Three to 20 years, that can almost be a generation that we're saving. So that's why it's so important. And then when it came to children, obviously I think Whenever we talk about children and their victimization, that tugs at the heartstrings even more. And that's a different type of crime to me, I have to say. Because these pimps, yes, they're sophisticated. Yes, you know, they've gotten very, very good at this. But if you are trafficking in children, that's something even worse, even more insidious. And so we want to make sure that if you are convicted of sex trafficking in the state of Nevada, that then the exposure is 10 to life in prison. And that's what everyone talked to us about. And can you imagine how many people with just that one conviction we will save? And we looked across the spectrum. What are other crimes worth? You know, how much prison time? All of that stuff. We looked at kidnapping. We looked at sexual assaults of children. And it's all consistent with that. We take it that seriously because the way I think about it, is truly, if a pimp is trafficking in our children, they are aiding and abetting the rape of that child. So we want the punishment to be similar, right? That same feel, so that's why it's so important. So that's another piece of our legislation, is increasing the punishment. Also, we heard so much today about demand side and supply side. And so General Master thought it was so important because we heard so many voices from everybody we spoke to that we had to do something with the demand side too, right? It's, it's two pieces that we have to deal with. So this bill, this sex trafficking legislation will apply to Jones if all those elements are proven. So with an adult, with an adult woman, force, violence, coercion, you've bought yourself into the world of sex trafficking. And if it's one of our children, yes, you've bought yourself into that world. So that was all very, very important and will make such a difference. So what other pieces are in this legislation? It is very long. You all have it in your packets. I think it's 40 pages long. And so General Master wanted to make sure we are doing as much as we can. So it is an omnibus piece of legislation, but I want to go through a couple pieces of what else is in there. 
So again, when we talk to law enforcement and to prosecutors um, and to the public defenders, you know, what would be helpful? What do you need? And so we looked at many things. And you heard about gangs. This is their new gig. This is what they're buying into. And so what are they doing? Sure, they traffic in guns and drugs. But what's significant and why I think they're changing to trafficking in humans is you can only sell that gun one time. You can only sell that baggie of drugs one time. How many times can they sell our women and children? Over and over and over again. So when we hear those stories of these pimps now trafficking in humans, in our citizens, how do we combat that? And so what we did is we put in sex trafficking into the racketeering statutes, into those RICO statutes. So if the whole gang is profiting off of sex trafficking, let's sweep up the whole gang. Same thing with conspiracy. Put sex trafficking right into the conspiracy statutes. What an effective tool. Another piece, we were receiving suggestions about the potential of wiretaps. And I will tell you as a former prosecutor, they're very difficult to get authorized. I don't know if Judge Boy is still here, but you can attest to that. Um, they're, they're tough to get a judge to say yes to, but I can't imagine anything better than we get a tip from a victim who's running in and out of hotels that this is happening. We get a wiretap. What better evidence would there be than it all being recorded? So that's in there as well. Now what else? How do we effectively combat human trafficking? What else works? Sex offender registration. And so again, if you're trafficking in humans, that's very, very different. And when you think about the policy behind sex offender registration, it's notice for us. It's for the community. So we are informed, so we can make decisions about where we live, where our kids go, where our friends go, where our neighbors go. We want to know if there's a rapist two doors down or a child molester around the corner. Don't we also want to know if there's a pimp who's grooming our children every day down the street? And I think the answer to that is yes. And so that's also in that legislation. Another piece that you heard about today, and we were talking about what do these prosecutions look like? How do we make them effective? And Jim Sweeten was talking about that. What's been so difficult is we will have our victim for just a couple days usually, right? An arrest is made of the pimp or an arrest is made of our victim. Happened for a couple days. So the pimp is arrested, the prosecutor goes into court with that victim, ready to testify at a preliminary hearing, which is just the first piece of a criminal prosecution to determine if there's enough evidence for trial. So the prosecutor goes in there with that victim, ready to testify, and the defendant, the perpetrator, says, no, no, I'm just gonna go ahead and waive that preliminary hearing. You don't need to testify today. Let's set it for trial You know, a year from now, two years from now. And what happens to those prosecutions? Our victims are gone. So there is no prosecution, there is no conviction, and that pimp is back out on the streets. So what is in that bill is what other states have done to great effect, is that the state also has a right to a preliminary hearing. So what does that look like? That again, the prosecution walks into the courtroom with that victim, ready to testify at preliminary hearing. The perpetrator says, no, never mind, and we say, well, yes, please take a seat. And we hear her testify. And then what does that do? So then in a year or two, if the trial is set, the judge has to make a determination whether or not that victim really is unavailable. So all of those due process rights, are, which are just integral to our system, are intact. But if that judge determines that victim really isn't available, we can't find her anywhere, we can use that prior testimony and we can convict that perpetrator. Very, very simple. So a few other pieces in this legislation. And those are really pieces for our victim, that specific woman, man, child that was victimized by our perpetrator. And those are mandatory restitution and asset forfeiture. Now, Assemblyman Hambrick um, has, has been a leader in this field, and so he passed an asset forfeiture statute, um, I think last session? Two sessions ago. But we are making it more robust. So you see, you know, you see it in the news, you also see it, you know, in rap videos. But these pimps have wads of money and fabulous cars and all kinds of assets. Well, with this legislation, if you help us pass this legislation, we can seize those assets and use it for the benefit of the victim so that we can make her whole. Isn't that what we're trying to do? Save the ones that have been victimized, make them whole as much as we can, as well as prevent all the other victims. 
So those assets are seized, and then the court has great discretion with this bill to determine restitution. How do I make that victim whole? Let me look at this for a second. What happened to this child? How many times did she have to go out every night and perform a sex act on a stranger and give that guy the money? What's the value of that? So it's broad discretion, letting the judge really take into account the particulars of that very case and then order mandatory restitution that goes to the victim. And then the last piece that I want to talk about that I think is just a very, very powerful piece is creating a civil cause of action for our survivors. What is that? That means that a victim of sex trafficking can sue her pimp for money and he has to pay it to her. And I think of all things, how empowering, talk about self-actualization, that she goes from being on the streets with this person controlling everything she does to then suing him and controlling at least a part of what he does. So again, very, very powerful. And this is all based on suggestions that we got from everybody in the community. And so I don't want to talk too much more about it. I will tell you that bill has been pre-filed, so that means you can find it on the Legislative Council Bureau's website. It's AB67. It's been assigned to the assembly side, to the Judiciary Committee. And so we will go through the process of testifying and supporting this legislation. But I can't thank you all enough for joining us in this fight and continuing to really fight to save future victims and to make a difference. Thank you so much.